But it's hard work to review your life. We would rather deny things about us, uh, work more hours, do more service for God than to face ourselves. And here we have this picture. It's a time to review your life. Face your problems. It's difficult. We find in the Bible again and again that there are various verses that tell us to look at ourselves. The book of Lamentation, a book of sorrow from the prophet Jeremiah. Let us examine our ways and test them and let us return to the Lord. And then the well-known Psalm of David, Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It goes on in the book of Matthew. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your own eye or your eye when there's a plank in your own eye? There's a speck in someone else's, a brother's eye, but you're trying to take it out while there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You cleanse the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. It's a matter of inside. We spend much time looking fine and nice and maybe fit. On the outside, the people have a good first response to us. There's nothing wrong with being fit, looking our best in every way. But if we spend all our time on the external, we're going to feel very unloved regardless on the inside. We're to have this inner look, inner cleansing before God. And that's where the peace takes place, beginning with the inside. And when it comes before the Lord's Supper, <clears throat> here again in a monthly or weekly or whenever we take the Lord's Supper, a man's supposed to examine himself before he, he eats the bread or drinks of the cup. Man, woman, child, this is for everyone. So Larry Crabb in a book entitled Inside Out has said, to look honestly at those parts of our experience we naturally deny is painful. Painful business, so painful that the analogy of death is not too strong. But to change according to Christ's instructions requires us to face all we prefer to deny. Real change requires an inside look. We've got to get a grip on what's going on inside of our lives. So much in terms of our advertising in this era, era of modern and postmodern times is about the cosmetics of the outside, what people see, what meets the eye. But God says, I look on the inside, and that's what is really important. And it's the inner look where we dare to look inside that gives us eventual peace before God and everyone. So get a grip on what's going on inside your life. This is what a quiet time is about, a weekly Sabbath included. I've known people that just have a very hard time sitting still. They're restless. And often it's a case that they, can't, they don't want to look at what's inside. It bothers them too much. They're denying, they're running, they're hiding from what they might discover or relearn about themselves. Well, how do we review our lives before God? We might think again of an onion and peeling back the various skins of the onion one at a time. And you might as well start with the obvious. Let's start with speech since the Bible says so much about speech. And Lois, if you'll just read what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 about speech and about the overflow of the heart. Matthew 12, 34. <clears throat> you brood of vipers, how can you who are evil say anything good? For out of the overflow of the heart the mouth speaks. The good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And the evil <clears throat> man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in him. But I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. And we find much talk about the tongue in the book of Proverbs, but also in the New Testament book of James. A very pointed remark. With the tongue we praise God and our Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. 
My brothers, this should not be. Wow, how can it be that our mouths may praise God in church and we walk out of church and we say something about someone in church? Uh, that sure was an ugly dress or whatever that was that we were going to say about a person. Or I sure don't like to hear so-and-so when they sing. Or we may even tell a lie about someone. It could be out of the evil, the jealousy in our heart that we say these things. We curse someone. It ought not to be that from the same mouth comes praise and uh, comes uh, critical thought, cruel thought, and even cursing. Uh, God says, keep on praising, but cut out the wrong talk. And the mouth, after all, is simply spewing out the wrong that is in the heart. But we start with speech and know a little bit about what's going on inside of our heart and mind by what we say. Well, we peel back another skin of the onion and realize that actions are obvious to observe in most cases. Actions, review your life by examining your actions. Each one should test his own actions. Then he can take pride in himself without comparing himself to someone else. It's so easy to spend our time looking at what other people do. But we ought to do is test our own actions, Paul is saying. And he goes on to say the following regarding the, uh, the acts of the flesh. And Lois, if you read from Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. <clears throat> Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. After reviewing our actions, we might then look at our attitudes. The thoughts more in the heart that are there, maybe they're prejudices against certain people. We see a person uh, of a certain height, short or tall, or a certain makeup, thin or wide, or we see a person with certain colored skin, or certain slant or roundness of their eye. Often someone different than ourselves and we have attitudes about those people. We see a person with a certain nationality, or we meet a person who talks loudly, and whatever it is, there may apt to be there is apt to be an attitude, if we're not careful about those who are either like us or not like us, and maybe we have just been hurt by one person, and forever we're going to hold a grudge. That's an attitude. Well, the Book of Colossians tells us to examine our attitudes. There are actions, and then there are attitudes. I've underlined some words that pertain to the attitude, the realm of attitudes. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Compassion and kindness and humility, I believe, are deep attitudes. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And in 1 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says to Timothy, the goal of this commandment is love, which comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. So attitudes are behind our actions. And attitudes are hard to decipher, to discern, to to pick out uh, what is an action, what's an attitude. Well, attitudes may remain rather hidden behind the scene, but they often come out in the way we talk, in the way we act toward others, toward God, 
towards situations that surround us. Here are some cartoons, contentment is an attitude. Obviously these cows are not content. And the saying goes around the world, the grass is green on the other side of the fence. And so we ever act out our lack of contentment and satisfaction for what God has given us and made us to be by envying someone else. I wish I were like them. I wish I had what that person had. I wish I had their looks. I wish I had their height. I wish they had their singing voice. I wish I had their athletic ability. Never content with the way God has made us. That's an attitude. That is a problem. Review your life by examining your emotions. Deep within our emotions, hiding behind attitudes, but often they spring forth when something happens that makes us angry, that makes us sad, that makes us envious. The emotions are apt to come out. A man by the name of Neil Anderson is not a relative of mine. He's written a book, Victory Over the Darkness. And he says this about attitudes, which I believe are, I should say about emotions, which I believe are true. I believe that God has designed us in such a way that we can know on a moment by moment basis if our belief system is properly aligned with God's truth. God has established a feedback system which is designed to grab your attention so you can examine the validity of your goal. That system is your emotions. We might call it an alarm system. When something happens, let's say you see a person that looks like another person you know, and you suddenly feel anger. It's not even the same person, but they remind you of a person who's wounded you deeply, and you can't get that anger out of your mind. You're shopping, and you can't remember what you went to the store to get or subconsciously all the time during the day when you're going through your activities that that anger is still boiling or bubbling behind the scenes. And, and you know what I'm saying? You understand what I'm saying? Yes. Um, so that's an emotion and we try to suppress and hold it down, but we can't. And likewise, emotions are wonderful things, are wonderful. It's, it's joy. God wants to express joy and laughter. But maybe we laugh at another person in a wrong way. Maybe there's someone we're in competition with and we laugh when they stumble, when they stammer, when they make a mistake. We laugh at them out of perhaps jealousy or something else. Beware of your emotions. I found that uh, when a person had, let's say that I had a, uh, a scratch on my car, I experienced this, where you have a nice car you like and someone puts a dent in it. I felt anger about that. Well, what, what does that say about me? Maybe God is saying you've made an idol out of this car of yours. Or someone says something about me that is true and I don't want to admit it. And I've gone to my point of Sabbath and discussed this with the Lord. Lord, I was really angered and depressed about so what someone said. And I ask, is it true? And maybe, yeah, God says, yes, it's true about you. Oh, well, now we must do something about it. Okay, I must admit my tendency to be weak in this area, my tendency to try to overcompensate, whatever it is. By admitting it, okay, I've come to God with my emotion and he begins to work it out into me. Maybe he confronts me about my pride. I'm really feeling good today because someone complimented me. I thought I did really well with that sermon or something else. And God says, you know, you're really proud about that, aren't you? I can take that away. But I can take that thing I'm proud about and praise God for the ability I'd never have without him. Praise God. Someone compliments, praise God that he has given some ability that can be of use to him. Praise God that he has a give, given a weakness whereby he can hold on to me and keep me under his handle, under his mighty, mighty hand as well. So emotions are wonderful things. They're God's feedback system. But there's a very important statement here about emotions, a caution. Beware of putting too much credibility in emotions. 
Emotions make wonderful windows into our souls, but terrible leaders. Terrible leaders. Talked recently with a young lady who was very burdened about a decision she had. Her emotions are telling her to do one thing, when maybe the real thing she is to learn is to simply step back and say, admit that I'm feeling this, but I'm not going to be led by my feelings. Uh, feelings make terrible leaders. When you're angry and you act on your anger, you're apt to hurt someone, including yourself. When you're depressed and very sad, you're apt to hurt yourself and maybe not make use of the opportunities God has given because you're so uh, somber and sorrowful that an opportunity goes by and you've not made good use of it. Well, emotions, as I said, here's a funny uh, uh, cartoon about men in a cave and they've come to this ancient sketching on the wall and they see, it says in interpretation, the man says, it's the pastor's wife. She went bonkers. She lost it. She, uh, it was too much. Or here are some insects. They're known as praying mantises. They look like they're praying all the time. But their attitude may be such, and their emotions, I just don't feel like praying, even though they're praying mantises. Well, you can find your own humor in various cartoons and other things. And then there are emotions that are really dark emotions that they need to come out so we know where they come from. Lois, if you read Galatians chapter 5 about uh, both the emotions that are good and those who are, which are bad. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. There again, you, you see in this text that holds attitudes, attitudes and actions and emotions. Uh, hatred and fits of rage seem to be emotions. Love, maybe an attitude as well, maybe speech, but it definitely is uh, an emotion, a passion. Joy is an emotion and, and peace as well is an emotion. And some of these overlap, they tend to. Often actions are also emotions, also attitudes rolled up all into one. Here's an important passage dealing with attitudes, uh, or emotions, I should say, emotions. And that is in Ephesians chapter 4. The Apostle Paul says, In your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. If anger continues, it turns into bitterness, a grudge against someone. And that bitterness gives a foothold, gives ground, literally, ground to Satan. Now, I don't believe that there is possession of a believer, that Satan actually takes total control of a believer. But we can give Satan a little nesting ground in our life, in our territory. He has a beachhead. And he has a beachhead because we've given him this bitterness, this anger towards someone, and we've refused to go to them and correct the situation or confront the situation. We've refused to do that. And so it is boiling underneath the surface, first with a little simmer of heat, but then it becomes boiling and it, and it begins to rule our lives. And Satan takes hold of that place of bitterness because he is a bitter person, angry against God. And then he will, through us, lash out at us, making us miserable, and we will make others miserable in this state of being as well. So we must get rid of the foothold 
the emotion that has become known and outward finally and hurting us and others. Someone gave me this statement some time ago and I added it to this series. Bitterness is like an acid which destroys the vessel in which it is stored more than the vessel in which or on which it is poured. I want to read that for emphasis again. Bitterness is like an acid which destroys the vessel in which it is stored more than the vessel on which it is poured. And you may have a vessel full of bitterness. You want to pour it like hot lava or acid on a person. You can't wait for the opportunity to do them harm. But while it's in you, it is rotting you away. It's making you miserable. It's making you vulnerable to Satan's attacks and temptations. You are apt to do other kinds of harmful things to yourself and to others because you won't give up the bitterness within. Christ died for our sins and we are to pour all of our bitterness and sorrow unto him. He can handle it. He will take it away. Pour it on it. Give it to him. Lord, I'm angry toward this person. I'm angry toward you. I give you this vessel of acid, awful as it is. And he consumes it. He's already done so. That we would be free from it. He has died for that awful emotion and attitude and action and speech that comes out of you. Pour it onto him, lest you be devoured by it and harm others as well. Peter Scazzaro in Emotionally Healthy Church has said this, in the past I spent hours with God beseeching him to accomplish my agenda and plans. However, now I spend much time in quiet place alone, a quiet place alone with my emotions, wrestling with the why question in an open contemplative for God and listening to him. Brendan Manning has said in a book, Lion and Lamb, from the seed of envy grows the flower of discontent. If only I could be that other person rather than the person God has made me, it's jealousy. From discontent grows despair. I fail so often. What's the use of trying to us? as he did to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 8. God is saying at each moment of the day, do not be angry. I am with you to protect you. The loving acceptance of the Father's will enkindles a fire within us that burns away envy and lights up our despondency and despair. He says, do not be afraid. I am with you to protect you. So, so give all that discouragement, discontentment, despair to him. Give it to him, for he will make you content. Again, Peter Scazzaro said, I was blind to how much my family in which I grew up dominated my daily life, especially my leading of the spiritual family called New Life Fellowship, which was his church that he planted. He said he was blind to it. He was really doing things according to his family. It is imp impossible to help people break free from their past apart from understanding the family in which they grew up unless we grasp the power of the past on who we are in the present. We will inevitably replicate those patterns in relationships inside and outside of the church. We act according to the way we saw our parents act in our home life. He went on to say, I passed on to the leadership of our church a driving passion to grow bigger and better, stronger every year. The pace was exhausting, much like my dad's. I attributed it to the opportunities for God's kingdom to expand. In fact, I was seeking to find value and worth in the church, not in Christ, much like myself. In the process of neglecting the people closest to me, much like my father. Only through this commitment to reflect seriously on my family history in light of the values of, of the gospel have I been able to get off the fast track of working and producing. Instead, slowly I'm learning to follow him in Sabbath rest, contentment, joy, peace, prayer, and reflection. So this is a call from, I believe, God to open your life 
to open the scriptures at the same time and review your words, your actions, your attitudes, your emotions. Don't be afraid to seek help from friends. Friends can help. I like this little saying, he who has a good friend needs no mirror. Just telling a friend can help you decipher, are you angry? Are you jealous? Are you discontented? Are you fearful? Are you seeking worth outside of the goodness of God? Are you bitter? My friend Tom, who I talk to weekly on the phone, he lives some distance, but I'm able to tell him my emotions to this day. And he's like this friend, even though I talk to him by phone and not uh, face to face, he is still like a mirror to me. And don't be afraid to seek professional help from a minister, others, counselors who deal with people's emotions, feelings, dealing with their attitudes all the time. Seek help. You can't do everything alone. Lois, if you'll read this example again from Peter Scazzaro's book, The Emotionally Healthy Church. The words of an old Hasidic rabbi on his deathbed are true. When I was young, I set out to change the world. When I grew older, I perceived that this was too ambitious, so I set out to change my state. This too, I realized as I grew older, was too ambitious. So I set out to change my town. When I realized I could not even do this, I tried to change my family. Now as I am an old man, I know that I should have started with myself. If I had started with myself, maybe I would have succeeded in changing my family, the town, or even the state, and who knows, maybe even the world. How are patterns of speech, actions, attitudes, and emotions similar or different from those of the family in which I was raised? That's a very important question. TBS Seminary is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS Ministry. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com. And here's an exercise for reviewing your life. Read over passages of scripture which call for self-examination. I've already given them to you. And by the way, we have a handout that will give you all of this. And in fact, it's in the back of your notes right now. that You can look at the closing pages and see these exercise, exercises to release review written out for you. Read any scripture passage which comes to mind that pertains to you. Remember, this is not a time to analyze others and criticize them. You are the subject at hand. You are under God's wonderful spotlight of healing. Record your thoughts and prayers. The third step is review your past week of activities, accomplishments and frustrations. Face them, pay particular attention to any feelings or emotions. As I said, I would feel anger because someone had scratched my car or feel discouragement because someone left the church, whatever the reason be. And I would work through these emotions, these attitudes, these actions, words I said before God, and allow Him to encourage me, correct me, exhort me by His Word. We need quiet times when we take the Scriptures, the Bible off the shelf, and look at it and say, Lord, uh, scrutinize, examine my life in light of this passage. And study passages of Scripture which speak to your situation and record any discoveries regarding yourself, actions, and attitudes. Take careful notes and don't be surprised if you find yourself incorporating many of your insights into devotions to share with others. In other words, 
you may say, this is all about me. But once you learn your lesson, you may take that information and share it with others. What we share by way of these particular lessons, these lectures, have come through us, often with great pain. But it's the very substance we share with others, not only from outside of ourselves, but from within ourselves, as God has worked and is still working in us to refine us. He still has a lot of work to do, but I can see now that he's done some work that we want others to enjoy, not by just looking at us, by, but experiencing themselves. We want you to have the same for yourself. All of this, the abundance that God gives you as you release your concerns and then review your life and changes happen that give you love, joy, peace, patience, all the wonderful fruit of the Spirit. So don't be afraid to pray, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my ways and anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Amen. This ends session eight.